can see here, my name is Mike Strzeski. I'm an archaeology professor at USI. And uh, I am the, uh, the archaeology person there. I mean, we don't have another archaeologist, so I do archaeology. Um, I do archaeology of the, the Midwest, um, particularly in the last few years. Uh, we did uh, some excavations at New Harmony, at the Harmonist Potter <coughs> Kiln. And uh, last summer we did excavations in, in and around the site of uh, Fort Weadnon um, near West Lafayette. And I've been working in the Midwest for the past 20 years or so, and a lot of my, I guess my roots in archaeology are in prehistoric or pre-contact archaeology, depending on what you want to call it. Um, so although I've been doing a fair amount of uh, historic period uh, stuff in the last five, seven years or so, um, I still I intend to get back to my roots at some point in time. Um, but uh, the talk that I'm going to give today, obviously, is about Yankee Town culture in southwestern Indiana. And uh, I guess some people, I was told by Mike Linderman that some people were disappointed that there was no Yankee Town talk the other <laughs> weekend uh, when it was supposed to be scheduled. But um, we had a cancellation, and there was some, you had to uh, kind of shuffle people around and, and that sort of thing. So now I've got the, the, the presentation together and I'll give you a talk about uh, what Yankee Town's all about. All right, so getting started here. <coughs> there, there's our biggest <laughs> problem with Yankee Town. <laughs> the, 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 we don't know a huge amount about the culture. Um, you know, even though Yankee Town culture has been known about for quite some time, it's been recognized as an entity, <coughs> so to speak, in, uh, in our part of the state. Uh, there just hasn't been a huge amount of work done on the culture to where you can say a lot about uh, who these people were, what they were doing, where they went, where they came from, all this kind of stuff that we really want to know. Um, and you know, I, part of the issue is the fact that um, we just haven't had, a, you know, there's only a finite number of archaeologists in the state with a finite number of projects they, they can undertake, and I think Yankee Town to some extent is kind of falling through the cracks. Um, but what I'm going to do today then is just tell you about what we do know and kind of offer up some explanations and some uh, uh, ideas about future research with Yankee Town. All right. Oops, I guess I got to point it towards there. Which button switch? All right, let's just do this the old-fashioned way. Oh, come on. <laughs> it's doing something here. There. Yeah. Back there, I had to go stop it. Um, all right, so this is a map. Actually, part of this talk comes out of a, a book chapter that I just wrote about Yankee Town. It's not yet published. Uh, in fact, I haven't even gotten the reviews back for it. But um, what I tried to do in this book chapter is kind of summarize what we know about Yankee Town and kind of offer some directions for the future. But this is an illustration from that chapter that I put together um, showing the extent of Yankee Town. Um, and you can see that the Angel site's right here, and Yankee Town's just a bit up the river over in uh, Warwick County. Now, from what we know, the, the carbon 14 dates that we have for the Yankee Town culture. Um, we would like to nail this down a whole lot better than we have already, but uh, from what we know, it extends from about 700 to 1200 AD, and it's a time period that we call the Lake Woodland. And overall, there are about 150 Yankee Town sites known, uh, most of which are from uh, Indiana side, although there are some from Kentucky and, and Illinois as well. So, Brian Redmond did a uh, dissertation on, on the Yankee Town culture back in 1990. And one of the things that he did was to look at all the Yankee Town sites that were out there and sort of characterize where these sites are located. That's one of the things he did, was to help characterize where these sites are located. Where are Yankee Town people's preferring to live? And what he found is that almost all Yankee Town sites are located on high spots near or on floodplains, right? So, you know, that we've got all these different floodplains. You know, here's Angel right there. These floodplains. Yankee Town people seem to prefer these floodplains probably because they're making their living as agriculturalists. And the floodplains are the best place to do that, right? You've got these floodplain soils that are sort of self-renewing. They flood. They uh, bring nutrients with the floods. 
um, and uh, the soils are relatively easy to turn over when you're gardening uh, implements are a digging stick and a, and a shell hoe and that sort of thing. You can turn those soils over and they're very rich productive soils. So that's why our Yankee Town folks are probably choosing these spots on the landscape. Now, this is you know where our knowledge gets a little bit fuzzy. Um, before about, oh stop. <laughs> so, how are people making a living? What were they doing to feed themselves? Well, we're virtually certain that what they were engaged in doing was growing a number of plants that we call, that archaeologists call the EAC domesticated plants, the Eastern Agricultural Complex is what it is. Now, if you look worldwide at worldwide history, there aren't too many instances where somebody kind of independently invents domestication and, and, and independently creates a suite of domesticated plants, right? You can look at uh, Mexico, you know, they domesticated corn. Uh, you can look at the, the, at the, uh, the Middle East, you know, they domesticated uh, wheat and, and a number of other plants, or, or the, you know, look at China, and rice. Um, but there's not too many instances of this thing occurring worldwide. One of the spots where domestication was invented independently was right here in the eastern North America. There was a number of plants, like I said, we call these the Eastern Agricultural Complex, a number of plants that were domesticated that today we would consider to be weeds. I mean, if you're in your garden this morning, it was kind of a nice morning, and you're trying to pull out some plants here and there that you didn't want to be there, probably some of them may have been uh, some of these Eastern Agricultural Complex plants. I, notice, uh, I know that I notice them sometimes when I'm in the garden pulling weeds. I'm like, oh, well, you know, this wouldn't have been a plant that the Native Americans pulled out because they would have used it. <laughs> but like I said, today we consider many of them weeds. And what they did is they had a bunch of these agricultural, a bunch of these weedy plants that they domesticated. Now, how do we know that they domesticated them? I mean, domestication really is a process of interfering with the lives of a plant or an animal, if you're domesticating an animal. You're interfering with the life of that plant. You're changing it, you're, you're, you're tending it, you're pulling out other plants you don't want to be there, you're watering it, and you get a little bit more interference, and what you start doing is you start selecting plants that you want. That is, you want more seeds, you want bigger seeds on that plant, and you plant the plants that you want to plant. So in a sense, you're playing God because you're selecting which plants are going to live and which plants aren't going to live, which ones are going to get consumed and which ones are going to get planted again for the next year. So archaeologists can see that plants are being domesticated when they start to see changes in the seeds of the plants. If you look at a plant under a microscope, you know what the wild seeds look like, right? When you see a domesticated version, it's going to have bigger seeds, it's going to have other little changes in the plant that can be traced archaeologically. So that's how we know that these plants were domesticated, right? So just to kind of give you an idea of what some of these plants are, if I can get this thing to work. There we go. Oh, come on. <laughs> I'm just going to put that down and do it this way. This is a plant called Goosefoot. Um, it grows all over the place. Um, especially in uh, kind of wetter spots that are uh, disturbed. Uh, a lot of times, I mean, I've seen uh, fields uh, in this area that before they come by and just nuke all the weeds in the, in the springtime. Um, you look at all the weeds that are growing in the, in the farm field and a lot of them would be uh, this, this plant here, goosefoot. It, the, the seeds for the plant are tiny little pinhead sized seeds. They're not very big at all but the plant gives off thousands and thousands of them. This one you know, sunflower, because this one um, is still a domesticated plant that we use and, and eat all the time, in fact. And that has a oily seed, where we get sunflower oil, right? And here's another plant called soapweed. Um, this is a plant, uh, the name kind of gives it away as to where it grows. It grows in more of marshy conditions, but um, it also has uh, oily seeds like sunflower. And again, the seeds are very, very tiny. So there's a whole bunch of these plants. Here's a couple others. These are plants that we think that they actively cultivated. That is, they were planting them as though they were planting a field. But there's, we don't see any changes to the plant. That is, we don't see the changes to the seed. So we don't consider them domesticated for that reason. But there's a plant called maygrass and another one called knotweed that gave off lots of seeds that people um, 
uh, grew in large numbers. So they were, in a sense, you could say they were agriculturalists. They had big gardens filled with these different types of plants, and they were a fair portion of their diet was made up of these different types of uh, what we call now weeds, weedy plants. But what happens then is that after AD 900, there is a switch over to the use of maize or corn. We don't know exactly when this happened. Again, it, there's a lot of gaps in our information about Yankee Town culture, but it was sometime in this area where the switch to corn happened. Um, uh, why exactly at this point in time they switched to corn? You know, to be quite honest, we have evidence for, for corn at a lot earlier sites. Um, there's evidence for corn at sites that date back to, I'm trying to remember the dates now, as early as uh, around 200 BC, I believe, are the earliest dates for corn. But it took them a while before they finally switched over to it. Um, and corn is a plant that gives, has lots and lots of seeds. They're big seeds, and there's some obvious advantages over those, those weedy plants. So they jump ship, they stop growing most of those weedy plants with the exception of sunflower, and they switch over to growing corn. So our Yankee Town people are the people that made this, this transition. All right, a little bit about background on how we know what we know about Yankee Town. Um, Yankee Town culture was first described by Mr. Glenn Black here. Uh, Glenn Black was uh, informed by a person from the Yankee Town area about this archaeological site. He went over there, investigated it, and found that there was some pottery there that he had never seen before. He didn't really know anything about it, and so wrote something up about it. It's around 1940 or so, uh, but didn't really do a whole lot of work at Yankee Town, the Yankee Town site itself. Uh, the first, more, you know, kind of major uh, treatment of the Yankee Town uh, culture was by Emily Blasingham. Um, who wrote her master's thesis at IU on Yankee Town pottery and um, tried to take all this variety of ceramics, which I'll show you and talk about later, and try to create some kind of order to figure out what the different types of pottery were and, and, and try to put them in different types and that sort of thing. As you can see, it's, uh, as I'll talk to you about this later, it's, it's been really problematic. But it wasn't until the 60s that the first large-scale excavations were conducted at uh, the Yankee Town site proper. Um, now, what, the reason that they did these large-scale excavations over a period of years uh, was because of the, uh, the Newburgh uh, Lock and Dam that was going to raise the level of the river. And they knew that the site was already being eroded into, that is, just the over the years, the course of the river has been chopping into the site little by little over many years. And um, they figured, okay, well, if we're gonna raise the level of the river, what's gonna happen is it's gonna make that a lot worse. So they decided, all right, in order to salvage some information from the site, what we're gonna have to do is go in and do some larger scale excavations, identify the features, and, and salvage them before this thing gets completely destroyed. So that's exactly what happened over a number of years Here's some, some shots. This, this is from the 1950s, showing that this erosion was happening, like I said, even before they uh, raised the, the level of the river. Um, this is Hilda Curry uh, salvaging a feature that's eroding into the river. And you can see you've got this big bank here that's just stuff kind of eroding out. And it continues up to the present day. Uh, this is Rex Garnowitz. Uh, formerly with the uh, Indiana State Museum, um, and in 2008, he's uh, got a, uh, a ladder there that he's used to climb up the edge of the riverbank there, and he's salvaging some features that are continuing to erode out of the riverbank, even up to the present day. So, there's another shot of the same thing, and you can see Michelle Green in down there lamenting, I think, the fact that these features are all are, are eroding. Here's a shot of some of those 60s excavations in progress. What they did is went to the edge of the river, the places that they thought were going to be destroyed, and tried to salvage the features there. See, so you've got a backhoe 
and they opened up some pretty large areas. You can see the scale on this particular excavation. This is from 1967, <laughs> the year I was born. <laughs> um, here's, this is 10 feet, so you can see that we're talking about an area that's at least 50, 60 feet in, 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 uh, in extent, and they identified a whole bunch of features there and, and excavated those. And as I mentioned just a, previously, that the work at Yankee Town is kind of ongoing. Um, I think the last time they were out there was 2009, if I'm not mistaken. I personally have not worked at the Yankee Town site, but um, this is a shot of uh, <coughs> magnetometry work that was done at the Yankee Town site in 2008. That's uh, Scott Hipskin and Colin Graham from IPFW uh, Archaeological Survey. What they did was um, take a magnetometer, that's what this gizmo is right here, take a magnetometer and walk over large portions of the site to see if they could identify the locations of features. First of all, to see if there are any features remaining, because it, like I said, it is eroding back. And if there are features remaining, where are they located? Now the magnetometer is an instrument that um, detects magnetic anomalies beneath the soil. It's used very routinely in archaeology today. In fact, people ask me this question all the time, like how did you know to dig in that spot? How do you know that's where you want to put your excavation unit? And this is one of the ways that we know how to do that. What it does is it, it detects slight perturbations. We can close the door there. It's closed. It is closed, all right. All right. So I'll just, just bear with it. Anyhow. So um, what it does is it detects slight perturbations in the Earth's magnetic field. So the Earth's magnetic field is just you know, all around us all the time. We don't really know it's there because we have no sense to detect it. Um, but what happens is that things like um, uh, when you burn something, uh, you burn a, a structure burst, burns down, or you have a hearth or a pit that's filled with fire cracked rock or something like that. What that does is it causes a very slight bend in the Earth's magnetic field, and this thing is able to pick that up. And when you do a survey like that, basically what you do is just walk back and forth and back and forth and back and forth over a huge area. It takes quite a while to collect the data, but what you wind up with is a nice map like this that shows the magnetic signature of the soil over that entire area that you've surveyed. <coughs> and this is from their report, and the Ohio River, this is the edge of the bank right here. So they surveyed this huge area right here and um, just point out some things that are uh, of interest. The types of things that we're looking for, a lot of these dark blobs like this, this, all these things up here, these are almost all features of some kind that are of interest to archaeologists. Um, sometimes you'll encounter stuff that's not of interest, like you know, broken tractor parts and crap like that, you know, things that you're not interested in. But you can't tell what's what from, the, from just looking at the map. Sometimes you run into something you're not interested in. But uh, there's a whole bunch of features still at the Yankee Town site that they were detected using the magnetometer. Now what they did then is put in some excavation units near the edge of the, the bank um, to see if some of these are at the, some of these are in fact prehistoric features. You can see there's a variety of units that were put in there. Here's some of the results. Uh, this is a part of a structure that was uh, excavated by the State Museum in 2008. Um, a part of a structural basin. That is, you can see here's the edge of the structure right there. They didn't excavate the whole thing, but they did identify a structural basin. And other features. So, and that's at the Yankee Town, Yankee Town site proper. Now, I mentioned that there are over 150 Yankee Town sites known. Have there been excavations at other Yankee Town sites? Yes, but not nearly as many as we would like. Um, some of the excavations were done a mm, number of years ago, some of them with less than ideal excavation methods. Uh, this was an, an excavation that was done by Gil Applestat at a site called Keister. It's, on, uh, it's in Vanderburg County. It's south of USI. Um, and uh, Gil Applestat was an amateur archaeologist. This is back when you, back in the 70s when you could 
be an amateur archaeologist and dig in the ground. Now it's illegal, you have to have a permit to dig in the ground. But um, Gil Applestaff was actually a pretty decent amateur archaeologist. He was uh, more careful than most. Uh, he uh, recorded what he did. He took pictures, as you can see. That was a bit blurry. But um, he's got excavation records. Um, and I inherited his collections back in about 2007. Uh, he was moving out of his house. He was going to go into a move into a retirement home and his son called me up and said, uh, you know, uh, we've got all these archaeological collections and uh, I asked my dad what he wanted to do with them and he said, ah, nobody's interested, just throw them in the garbage. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so his son called me and he's like, I don't think we should throw them in the garbage. Do you want them? I said, yeah, I do want them because these are you know, good collections. They were well excavated, etc. I would hate to see them just thrown into the garbage. And, so um, they donated them to USI, and I've gotten a couple grants uh, over the years, and we're finally, I mean, on the last couple bags of stuff, finished cataloging all the stuff from the Keister site. And uh, so that's kind of my involvement in Yankee Town, is that the, one of the components at Keister is a Yankee Town component. So there's an angel component, there's a Yankee Town one, there's a man face one, which is a bit earlier. But I've, I've gotten involved with Yankee Town stuff through, through this site right here, Gil Applestad stuff. I plan on trying to write that all up. I uh, just found out the other day I got a sabbatical for next, next fall. Uh, so I'm going to have some free time. That's one of the projects I'm going to try to tackle is write all this stuff up. But there's um, Applestad's excavations uh, in the early 70s. And you can see it's a well-organized looking excavation. It's not just digging holes looking for stuff. Um, there's been some other excavations of Yankee Town uh, sites done by uh, Susan Alt more recently. Uh, Susan Alt's at IU. Uh, she d excavated at a site, couple sites called Dead Man's Curve and Squirrel Hunter and found some structures. Um, some, some of this stuff that she found was Angel rather than Yankee Town. Uh, but there is some Yankee Town material coming from there as well. Um, that's just a photo of, of Susan's uh, excavation there. You can see some burned soil and walls and stuff like that from the area that she opened up at that site. All right, now perhaps the most distinctive characteristic of Yankee Town is their pottery. Um, it doesn't look like anything else. I mean, it's very uh, unique. That is, you pick up a piece of Yankee Town pottery, you know it's Yankee Town pottery right off the bat because it's the certain the attributes, the way that it was made, etc., is very, very recognizable. So I'll talk a little bit about Yankee Town pottery and what it's all about. The nice thing about Yankee Town stuff is that much of it is decorated, and archaeologists like pottery that's decorated because when things are decorated, they're done in you know, a certain distinctive fashion. That is, we pick up a piece of pottery off the ground and we look at the type of decoration and oftentimes we can say, that is man face pottery, or that is Yankee Town pottery, or that is angel pottery, right? Undecorated stuff is a whole lot more difficult to identify who made it. Um, it gets complicated, but it's much nicer to have decorated stuff because you can pick it out and you know what it is right away. So that's the Yankee Town decorated stuff. One thing that also about Yankee Town pottery that's somewhat distinctive is that it's grog tempered. And I'll explain what that means. I've got a whole bunch of Yankee Town pottery here that you can come look at after I'm done talking. Um, but one of the things that archaeologists look for when you're trying to identify who made a piece of pottery, right, is the type of temper that's found in the pottery. That is, when you're making the pot, one of the things they do is they add some foreign material to the clay to keep it from cracking when the, when the pot dries. That is, when you're making a piece of pottery, you've got the clay, and the clay has water in between the clay particles. So when the pot dries, the pot contracts like this. And what will happen oftentimes, and I'm sure you've noticed this before, you have a piece of clay, you lay it out, and it dries and it starts getting cracks in it. You don't want that to happen, of course, to a piece of pottery because your pot's not going to hold water, or it's not going to be watertight, it's got a bunch of cracks in it. So you have to add temper to it. 
So the Yankee Town Potters added what we call grog, which is crushed up pot sherds. So they took previously fired pots, crushed up the broken pot sherds, added that to the clay, and that helped it to keep from cracking. So again, with the grog temper, if I pick up a piece of pottery, I look in the, in the sherd here, and I can spot the pieces of grog, and that also helps me to tell <clears throat> what type of pottery it was and who made it. It's got grog temper in it. Grog. <laughs> All right. So these are the different types of vessels that we know that Yankee Town people made. Uh, this is from Brian Redmond's dissertation. Like I said, he did his work on Yankee Town culture back in the 1990s, and he had this nice illustration in his dissertation. Um, so what we can see is that there are a variety of different uh, vessel shapes. Right? We've got jars of various types, right? bowls, what we might call a pan, or no, it's kind of a wok-shaped vessel like this, and various miniature vessels too, like little miniature bowls and little miniature jars. Um, we presume that these have different functions. That is, you know, they didn't just make a variety of different jars for no reason, that they probably had different functions for them. Uh, although, in archaeology, we often have a pretty tough time telling you exactly what the function of that vessel was or of this type of vessel. Um, we would assume, though, that vessels with closed orifices, you know, that kind of come up to a, a small orifice, probably for, were for cooking or storage or something like that, whereas ones uh, like this, more bowl or kind of like I said, wok shaped vessels would have been ones that were for uh, food preparation or. Uh, uh, or, or for, for eating, that is, you, know, you take all the food, you lay it in there, you lay it out, and people take from the, take from the vessel there to, uh, to, to eat, uh, eat meals, right? Not really sure what those little ones were for, but at any rate, you do find them. And it looks like a seat storage. Which one, sorry? And the smaller one looks like a seat storage. It's quite possible. Yeah, yeah I don't know. All right, so I'll just kind of show you some of the things. Like I said, it's so distinctive, this Yankee Town pottery. Um, and they had some certain ways of, uh, of decorating their pots that you don't see anywhere else. Uh, and one of these is this fillet type uh, decorative technique. What they would do is they would take a strip of clay and lay it along the vessel. You can see right here. And then they would put these little nick marks in it like that. Back and forth. You see that? You know, 100% Yankee Town. So fillet. Here's a little bit closer view of one of them. I've seen that same type of stuff. Have you? On the Kentucky side of the river. Uh huh. Well, it's all, it's almost certainly Yankee Town. Yeah. I have some pieces. Do you? So sometimes the fillet is rather simple. That is, it's just a single strip that goes across. Usually the near the orifice of the vessel, but sometimes also it gets rather complicated, so they lay these strips, a lot of times in these kind of V shapes and that sort of thing, um, and just nick it all, all along there. It's, it, it's, it's actually pretty nice looking stuff. Here's another uh, thing that we see in Yankee Town pottery. This is called pseudo fillet. That's what we archaeologists call it at least. <laughs> it's fake fillet in a sense, right? What they would do is trail a line in there and nick the line. So it kind of looks like fillet, but it's, it's maybe just a more expedient way of doing it without laying all those strips of clay onto it, right? Pseudo fillet. Here's another really distinctive Yankee Town attribute. This incising of the vessels into semi-hard clay. That is, sometimes people would decorate their pottery when the clay was wet. And when you decorate, no, not these guys, I'm talking about other cultures. Sometimes when they would do that, when they would decorate the pottery when it was wet, that is, you can tell there's almost like a trough in the clay where their finger went along or whatever tool they were using to make the design. Right? It, kind of, it almost looks like you're plowing through the clay because it kind of you, know, you can see the clay kind of parting on either side. Our Yankee Town people didn't do that. They waited until it was nearly dry, and then they used something sharp, maybe like a, a flake, a stone flake, 
to cut into the clay. So it was like leather hard, perhaps. And they cut into the clay like that these particular designs. Very, very distinctive designs, too. A lot of the designs are like this, what we call like a ladder. That's just, I mean, kind of looks like a ladder, I suppose. But basically what you're talking about are two parallel lines here with a whole bunch of hash marks on the inside, diagonal hash marks on the inside. Same thing here. You can see these two parallel lines there with the hash marks going along it. So that's, again, a very distinctive Yankee town. Sometimes those uh, incising would be in, in uh, line-filled triangles. So they'd make a triangle like that and hash lines on the inside of it. Same thing here, hash triangles. And sometimes there are other things. Um, you know, this is obviously not either, <laughs> either one of those. Unfortunately, you just sometimes you get just a tiny bit of it, and you can't really see the whole picture, the big picture of what it was supposed to be. Um, but obviously, this was a bit more of an involved design on this particular piece of pottery. Here's another thing that Yankee Town people did a lot of. We call this bar stamping. So what they would do for this design, is they would have some type of a tool that was, I don't know, vertical. And they would stick it into the clay over and over again like that. Sometimes the, the, the tool is curved, so it leaves a curved line over and over again. But just poke that in over and over again, along usually along right along under the lip of the vessel like this, and sometimes along the uh, along the rim, right? But just poking that in over and over again along the edge of the vessel. That's called bar stamping. There's it a little bit closer. All right. So some other stuff they did then. Um, they put these little nodes, so what they do is take a piece of clay and kind of make a little, it almost looks like a little cone or something like that, and attach it to the side there. There's a whole bunch of little ones over on this, this particular vessel. Uh, lugs, lugs are uh, like little ears. They look like little ears that they'd stick on the side of the vessel. Here's something we would call punk tape, so you can see this particular shirt here, what they've done is bar stamped it all the way here, and then they've stuck something in there, like directly into the into the clay. Same thing here. This one's kind of got just a circle. It looks like it might be a, a stalk of grass or something like that. It's relatively small, so they poke that all along here. This one was kind of interesting because I looked at it up close. And it wasn't a reed, it wasn't a stalk of grass or anything like that. I finally figured out what it was. It was a crinoid stem, which is a fossil. Oh. So if you know what I'm talking about, I'm sure you've seen these before. They probably find them in limestone all over the place. But they have this sort of you know, radial design to them. And I could see the impressions of the crinoid stem in the clay. So they used a fossil to decorate that pot or piece of pottery, which is kind of neat. <coughs> All right, so here's the big problem. Archaeologists love to put things into different types, right? We like to think, put things into categories. We've got this type of pottery, we've got that type of pottery, we've got that type of pottery. And ever since Emily Blessingham has been working with, with the Yankee Town stuff, she and other archaeologists have attempted to put the Yankee Town pots into different categories. So we can say that this type of pottery is Yankee Town this, and that's Yankee Town that, right? <coughs> I've basically given up that task because what I've found in looking at Yankee Town pottery is that there's so many different ways of decorating it and they're all in just different combinations that there don't seem to be a whole lot of, let's say, rules as to how to make a decoration on a pot. One guy would stick a bunch of nodes on there, put hash marks all over there and bar stamp it. Another guy would stick some nodes, punctates, some hash marks there. This guy would do this, this guy would do that, that guy would make a ladder design. I mean, there are some <coughs> things that you see over and over again, but the combinations are unique, as far as I can tell, that I don't see much point in trying to 
very painful process, let's just say, to try to create some types. And I don't know that we would really get all that much out of it anyways, even if we were able to create some types. Um, let's Maybe just say. the different families? Sorry? Different families? Oh, there had to have been it's possible. a lot of people who did pottery. Mm -hmm. So no doubt, yeah. It was a handed down tradition, like a, a lot of things. You mm -hmm. think that maybe that a certain family that taught their children would have right. this, maybe some of the same markings. No, I don't doubt that. that. Yeah, that a certain lineage or people from a certain clan would decorate their pottery in a certain manner. But yeah, it's tough to pick all that, pick out any any types there. So I'll just show you a couple more different ceramic artifacts that they have at. Uh, Yankee Town that we find in Yankee Town sites. These are ceramic beads that were found by a state museum in 2008. Um, we also know of ceramic figurines, which are somewhat unique. We don't see a lot of this kind of stuff in the archaeological record of our part of the country. Um, but Yankee Town people did make little, little figurines of people. Here's another thing. These are discs, ceramic discs that are found at Yankee Town sites. I've got a few of them here. If you want to look afterwards, they come in different sizes. Right? There's some small ones, there's some large ones. They're ground or flaked and ground into a circular shape, an old sherd, right? a piece of a pot. Um, what they're used for, we don't know for sure. They could have been some type of a gaming piece that involved using these disc-shaped game, gaming pieces, you know. I'm not exactly sure what they were used for. That's the thing about archaeology. We don't have all the answers, but... <laughs> all right, so here's one of our big questions about Yankee Town, and this is going to relate back to what's going on here at Angel. And this is the sort of thing, this is the question I was really trying to address when I wrote this chapter. It's like, what is the where did a Yankee town come from and what happened to it? Right? So, what was its relationship to the things that came before? So, the thing that came before Yankee town was, is called man phase. Uh, probably many, many of you have heard of the man site. Um, and that site was occupied up until about 500 or so ish, right? And then we have a phenomenon called Yankee Town. So are they related? That is, did the man phase people kind of turn into Yankee Town people, for lack of a better word? Or is there a hiatus there? Did the, Yan did the man phase uh, uh, you know, flourish for a period of time, and then the area is abandoned for a while, and then our Yankee Town folks come in, right? That's the sort of thing we want to know. We want to be able to kind of trace whether or not this culture change through time or there maybe is a replacement by a different culture and the other thing we want to know is towards the tail end of Yankee Town right so where did it come from and where did it go so did Yankee Town change into the angel phase did it become the folks that, that built this place right so those are the questions we're trying to deal with when we're talking about Yankee Town so this is just some, this looks rather complicated, but I'll explain it. What I did is I compiled all of the radiocarbon dates that we have for Man Phase, for Yankee Town, and then these are some of the angel dates, the early ones. I didn't put the later ones in because I was really interested in this transition, so the later ones really didn't concern me. But what you find here is that we've got man phase dates that go all the way from eh, 100 or so AD up to about, there are some dates that even look like they might be around 600 or later, or later. Um, particularly at uh, this Keister site that I've been working with, we've got some pretty late dates there. But what you see then is there seems to be a short hiatus. There's not a good deal of overlap between man phase in Yankee Town, nor do we see any kind of transition. That is, you might expect something around here to look kind of like Angel, or kind of like uh, man phase and kind of like Yankee Town. That is, they're in the act, they're actively transitioning from one cultural type to another. You, you, we just haven't seen anything like that up to this point. So my guess is, at least at this point, that there seems to be some kind of a gap right here. A small one, maybe, 100 years perhaps, 
but there does appear to be some kind of a gap right here. If you go down to the other end of, of Yankee Town over here, it's different. What you see here is that Yankee Town sites, particularly at Yankee Town site itself, there are a lot of really late dates that go all the way up until around 1200 or so AD. These dates are virtually identical and overlap just about completely with the very early angel dates. Okay, so what that at least says on the surface is that there's some Yankee Town people here and angel people here at the same time. Huh. Well, if you remember that map that I showed you at the beginning, Yankee, at the Yankee Town site and the Angel site aren't that far away from one another. I forget how many kilometers it is or how many miles it is, but it's not that far. If these guys were here at the same time, you would expect this, some evidence for interaction. That is, you know, Yankee Town folk come over to Angel, you know, do some trading or something like that, and vice versa, perhaps. Right? That is, if they were on friendly terms. They may not have been, we don't know. So this, I just put this here to show you that there's a pretty good overlap between man phase extents and Yankee Town phase extents. The dark stuff here is man phase, right? And there's the man site in Posey County. And the Yankee Town phase and Yankee Town site. So they're, they're just about occupy the same space. So where did those Yankee Town motifs come from? All that fillet and the incising and all that kind of thing. Does it just drop out of the sky? Where the heck do these people come from, right? <clears throat> if you look at the man phase pottery, you don't see any of that stuff. This is stuff from, uh, is it from Mansage or Keister? I forget, I forget what site it's from. But at any rate, you don't see any of that Yankee, those Yankee Town uh, pottery motifs. In fact, some of this stuff at the man phase looks completely different from Yankee Town. It's not even similar at all, right? This is some of that complicated stamp pottery from uh, the man site, and it's and it's it's completely different from from Yankee Town stuff. So we just we just don't see a nice transition from man phase over to Yankee Town. And like I said, we still have that gap there, that temporal gap that needs to be looked at a little bit better. All right, same thing. Relationship between Yankee Town and Angel. Here's Angel phase right there, the dark. There's Yankee Town, a little bit more extensive. Uh, but again, if we're trying to trace out these pottery motifs, you don't see anything that looks like a transition from Yankee Town to Angel. So if these Yankee Town folks became Angel phase people, we haven't seen it yet in the archaeological record, right? This is this is some angel face pottery from the Keister site. It's it's a virtually all plain. The vessel shapes are different. It just looks a lot different from the angel or from the uh, Yankee Town stuff. So those are some you know some of the questions we're trying to address is where this thing came from, where did it go, and it's, what's its relationship to these other cultures. And this is an interesting thing to point out, like I said, Angel site and Yankee Town site are very close to one another. You would expect some kind of interaction between them if they were occupied at the same time. If you look at the pottery that's been recovered from Angel, there is virtually no Yankee Town pottery at Angel. And there's a few shirts here and there, perhaps. Um, but you would expect more if they were neighbors, let's say, for an extended period of time. And, and vice versa, that is, if, if, at Yankee Town, you don't see a whole lot of angel pottery in the Yankee Town levels. So there's some real questions there that have yet to be answered, and I can't pretend to have the answers at this point in time. Um, so there's really little evidence for interaction between these different cultures. Here's my guess, though, if I were to throw out an opinion on the matter as far as the transition from Yankee Town to Angel. I would say that probably Yankee Town does not have se does not seem to have changed into Angel. Despite the fact that it comes before Angel, it seems to be a different game. They're doing something different. Their material culture is a whole lot different. 
And particularly with some of the early dates they have now from Angel in coring in Mount A, found some really early dates in Mount A, it would appear that the Angel folks, at least some of them are people that came from somewhere else. They arrived in this part of the Ohio River Valley and started setting up a mound center right here. Right? Now, whether or not they were on good terms with the people, the Yankee Town folks who are here, it remains to be seen, right? You know, they could have been invited. They could say, okay, yeah, come in here, set up this mound center, we'll, you know, kind of cohabitate here on this part of the Ohio River, or they could have been invaded in a sense, right? You know, some people show up, they're like, can't, can't move over, you know, that kind of thing. We're building the mound center here. And uh, they could have been hostile towards one another. We just don't really know. But if I were to venture a guess, like I said, I would say probably that these angel peeps were probably immigrants from somewhere else, maybe somewhere farther down the Ohio River Valley, be my guess. Um, and they were looking for a place to set up an angel or set up a uh, Mississippi and Mount Center. So that's all I have to say. <laughs> And what I got is some angel pottery, or some uh, Yankee Town pottery here. I can submit, I can answer questions, and you can come up and have a look at the pottery. And get the pottery. In which the uh, the uh, building was probably was like angel buildings. Mm -hmm. And I, do you know what Yankee Town houses looked like, or anybody found any? Well, they did have that house basin over at uh, the, the State Museum, uh -huh. found in 2008. They, it was just a a rectangular outline. There were no posts or anything like that, so they're not exactly sure how it was constructed. I don't think we have a real great idea about what, what Yankee Town houses look like yet. But if you found an Angel Face Mississippian type house, yeah. as I understand it, the Keister site, yeah. with Yankee Town pottery, yeah. and your conclusion, if I understood your talk correctly, was that there was, might be a, a Mississippian trader who was in here on friendly terms mm -hmm. with and or <coughs> intermarrying with some of the Yankee Town people that were and the women probably made the pottery. I was a bit more certain about that when I gave the talk. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> At this point in time, I'm kind of doubting my conclusions about that site. Okay. Um, you've got Yankee Town stuff and Angel at about the same level. <laughs> And I'm not sure that they were there at the same time. They could have been, but they might not have been either. So that's the problem. But there's such an abrupt halt in the making of the Yankee Town pottery and mm -hmm. how it's made and what what the temper is and so forth. Yeah. Is it possible, if you look at the historic record, that there have been dramatic and sudden changes mm -hmm. in the kinds of because everybody's basing this partly not just on the dates but on the dramatic and sudden disappearance of Yankee Town pottery mm -hmm. and the major change, mm -hmm. both how the pottery is made, what the temper is, yeah. shapes and so forth, <clears throat> is that the Yankee Town people said Oh, we like this stuff better. Mm -hmm. We're going to make that. They just dropped it and went Just dropped it. I mean, I know that you always think there are going to be gradual changes in material culture, but yes. is that really true? No, that's not necessarily the case, I don't think. And that's one of the things I said in the chapter, too, is like, there's no reason why, because everybody's looking for this kind of smoking gun where you have this transitional pottery that looks kind of like angel stuff and looks kind of like Yankee Town. It's, it's a mixture of the two. Um, but there might not be a smoking gun. There might. It all depends on people's ideas about their traditions. I think that if you feel it's important to maintain your way of doing something, then you'll stick to it, no matter who's around here. You know that kind of thing. You know you'll resist. You'll you'll resist to changing things because you feel it's important that you maintain this way of doing things. It's your traditional way of making pottery, right? But if you don't care. That is, it's not important to you. If somebody shows up with a new technology and they're very powerful and they got chiefs and big mounds and all that kind of thing, you might say, well, you know, I'm going to jump on board and get on the bandwagon, get on the Mississippian bandwagon and just forget about the way that we were doing things. So, yeah. Well, it's also, isn't it, that it might be easier to make uh, the Mississippian pottery. If the women were having to do all this work, mm -hmm. and putting little slays and right. yeah. patching it, and when I looked at Yankee Town pottery, it seemed to me that a lot of it was incompletely fired. That is, the outside would be fired really hard, uh -huh. the inside would be still sort of gray and soft, uh -huh. or clearly they were firing their pots differently than the 
Yeah, I think they were. I am They're sorry. firing the pots different. Because that Yankee Town stuff is always like orange color. It was fired in an oxidizing, firing atmosphere with lots of oxygen. But and some of it's white on the outside and gray on the inside, like the gray stuff didn't get completely fired. I don't know if that Yankee Town slip. stuff is pretty well made. It's nice pottery. It holds up pretty well. Well, that's true. So, but it, maybe it was just easier to use all that uh, yeah. shell temper yeah. and big giant pots, and maybe they needed to make bigger pots uh -huh. because they were storing more corn or something. Sure, perhaps. S and if the women were doing it, maybe it was just easier. Yeah, I, you know, I don't doubt that's possible, but I just have no. But it's just that no data to say one way or the other. You know what I mean? So archaeologists don't really believe if there's a dramatic and sudden change in material culture, mm -hmm. that it could be the same people on either side of that line, or that it's harder to believe. It could be. I think it's a lot more complicated than we think. Because at one time, um, people were you know, uh, of the opinion that either a Angel, or either Yankee Town became Angel, or it didn't. Yeah. But I think it's probably a lot more complicated in the sense that you might have some immigrants there who are straight up Mississippian people who arrive in this area and then are influencing or somehow causing some type of cultural change to the other folks that happen to be here. So this is kind of complicated give and take process between the people that were already here and the new people. And I just think there's a lot more work that we need to do to try to figure this all, the whole thing out. There's just lots and lots of unanswered questions. What would you do to figure it out? What would you do? I don't know, good question. Well, I'm going to work on that keister stuff for one. <laughs> I can't say that's going to answer any of the questions, but um, you know, I would do my best to try to find some site that was more of the right near that beginning of the angel stuff late, you know, and, and to be honest, a lot of people have tried that route already and have been somewhat, uh, they get ambiguous results out of it, so I don't know that it, it's going to be a tough nut to crack, that's my opinion. Yep. You mentioned at the beginning the affinity of both the Angel groups and the Yankee Town groups to these flood plains. Uh -huh. And uh, I've noticed a little affinity of the man people and the Angel people to the sloughs also. Uh -huh. Does Angel have any, or does Yankee have any affinity to sloughs? And Part of the problem with teasing apart the, the, the Yankee Town and Angel relationship is that almost all Yankee Town sites have an angel component on them? So it's like you see these sites okay. with Yankee Town stuff and angel stuff, and it's almost impossible to tease apart, you know, what what the relationship between the two is. Like Keister, for example, has man phase, but there's a little there's some separation there in this stratigraphy. And then you've got Yankee Town and Angel right on top of it. And a lot of these sites, same thing find Yankee Town and Angel, Yankee Town and Angel all together. So they're picking very similar spots on the landscape. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I think that's just a reflection of the fact that they both like the same types of spots. You're looking across the landscape, you see a high spot over there, that's a great place to put a little farmstead. We plop it right there, and then their, your angel guy does the same exact thing, because he's looking for the same kind of thing. And then if there's a slough nearby, well, that's a regular Even better. grocery store. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, um, you know, the, the biggest piece of uh, floodplain in the area of uh, Union Township and mm -hmm. the Yankee Town sites there too. Yes, yes. Okay. Keister is in Union Township. Okay. There are. I don't know off the top of my head if there are any other Yankee Town sites in that area. I don't doubt there are, though. I'd have to check. Mm -hmm. Yep. Would DNA analysis solve the problem? Uh, I don't know whether Yankee Town has any. Skeletal material that has been. I don't know of any Yankee Town skeletal material. Did they cremate their dead, or is it? I don't know that we really know anything about Yankee Town burial practices. They're is just. I don't think there we have any. There aren't any burials from Yankee Town. Yeah. So you can't use DNA so far, anyway, no. as a way of solving. No, we don't have any history. skeletal material from yeah. Yankee Town sites. So that would be a, another cultural difference. That a difference in mortuary habits. For yeah, me. sure, sure. It's an absence of data, but yeah, I mean the fact that you never find any Yankee Town burials says something. I suppose. A suggestion, at least, of yeah. a difference in mortuary habits. Uh -huh. I just, yeah, we just need to do more excavations at Yankee Town sites to say more about what the heck they were doing. And 
Would there be any possibility of going back to the Keister site? I suppose there probably is. Well, one of the reasons they did the excavation there was that there was a, a lot of erosion happening at the site. So uh, it was like all this water coming off of an agricultural field just going through this patch of woods and just cutting these big ditches through the woods. And uh, this apple stat um, found just all sorts of pottery eroding out of this ditch and, and realized that there's a big site there and they did the excavations as a result. No bone? There is some bone, but no human bone, yeah. There's some animal bone. Um, but, uh, Yeah, I went by the site a couple of years ago just to check it out, and there's still lots of water and lots of ditches and stuff like that. Um, it's possible to do some more work there. In fact, it wouldn't be a bad idea because the excavations that he did um, were, I mean, you know, he did a decent job of it, but he was an amateur. It was the early 70s. His record keeping wasn't as good as we'd like today. So I think it might be a good idea to revisit the site to try to answer some questions that we have. Yeah. How big is the Yankee Town site? Do they have any? Oh, I know someone's washed into the river, so you have to account for that. Yeah. If you can. It's pretty but, big, but I don't know acres off the top of my head. I'd have to look that or up. Or population. Uh, are population they are the site. Yankee Town sites as big as Angel Face early Angel Face Mississippian villages, or are they tend? No, I think they tend to be smaller. That's my impression, at least. The, what what Brian Redmond looked at, um, the Yankee Town site itself is the only one that's really a pretty good size. The rest of them are more, I think, like farmstead sizes or something like that. There's a couple things that might be a little bit larger than that, but other than that, you know, there's no big Yankee Town site. That uh, site of Yankee Town is that probably owned? Is that staying owned? It's owned by uh, Alcoa. Oh, okay. Kind of a corporation owned it. Yeah. And. Ha and how much of it is washing into the river? Uh, I mean, how long does the bank, eighth of a mile? How long is it? Yeah, how I mean, much has eroded since we started looking? No, no, I meant um, the face along the river. Yeah. That pertains to this uh, <coughs> Hickey Town pottery, um, you know, the development. Is it uh, an eighth of a mile or a quarter of a mile along, along the river? I don't know off the top of my head. I'd have to refer back to the reports. Like I said, I, I personally have never worked at the Yankee I didn't Town know if it was site. a large length. Or, uh, it's it's fairly substantial though. That's my understanding. So there's it's been eroding forever. So it's a lot of a lot of loss there. Yeah, but there still is some there as we can see with the the magnetometry. It's not completely gone, as it happens with some sites. You know they're just completely eroded away and they're gone. They're just well, yeah, some gone. rivers I've read where when people go looking for something in the river uh -huh. where the river used to be here. They found out that this is a farm field, uh -huh. and the new river is a half a mile away. Sure. Has the old Ohio done stuff like that in this area, or has it pretty much stayed where it the Ohio uh -huh. well, Rivers like that are always migrating. You know, as a river matures, you know, it gets more of these bends in it like this. You know, these immature rivers tend to go relatively straight as it matures. It starts migrating back and forth like this, and then there's a cutoff, and you get an, an oxbow lake or whatever, and it's. You know, it's, it's an active, you know, Well, there's channel. lots of things the river can destroy. That, uh, exactly, yeah, yeah. And sometimes, too, you know, talk about the river migrating, you'll see, like, a loop in the... Well, here, I can show you. I can get this thing to cooperate. And here, for example, how the river's migrated over the years, it's adding on sediment right here, and it's losing it in this direction, so it's slowly... The loop is getting bigger here, cutting into this direction as we as the years go on. And so, if you have an archaeological site, let's say right here, that dates to what 3,000 B or C or something like that, you can say, oh well, the river is X distance away from the river now, or the site's X distance away from the river now. But when that site was occupied, it could have been right there. You know? But that's a matter of going in and coring and seeing when these different sediments were laid down, and you can trace how that's happened over. Because there could be a lot under the sediments over there. It could be too, and it depends on the it depends on the, uh, Which could the circumstances. Be why you didn't find any burial. Yeah, well, in certain circumstances, sites can get buried very, very deeply. I mean, okay, like about was it about five or six years ago? No more than that. But at any rate, 
I was doing an excavation. It was a salvage excavation for one of the state parks right next to the Ohio River. Now, this is over towards Louisville, so it was not right around here. But we were doing an excavation where they are going to put in a boat ramp, and we found, and this is right next to the Ohio River, we found deposits literally about 12 or 15 feet below the surface. And we took a back, we had a backhoe, and we were digging, and we kept going down, we kept finding stuff, we kept finding stuff. We got down to the, the stuff way down at the bottom here. We were still finding artifacts like 12 or more feet below the surface. We got a little piece of carbon from one of those features. We dated it, it was 8,000 BC. So, you know, some of these sites, right next to the river especially, are going to, can to have possibly be buried very, very deeply, especially if they're very old, of course. So it's, you know, this, this, this is an active landscape. There's a lot going on here. Some of the pottery that we just discussed, uh, different types of uh, pottery images of the uh, Yankee Town culture. You see the grog, the influence of the grog here, and then the planer. Uh, these are the either coins or game items, uh, other type of architecture, the way they did the trimmings. Very excellent description. So I would use that. Trimmings and excellent examples of Yankee Town.